Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. My name's Eric. And I'm Nicole. Well Nicole, put some coffee on the stove, because this is going to be a beast of a video. Alright, I'm ready for it. So here we go. Up until this point, we've used the free electron model, which assumes an infinite square well as the system potential. But it turns out the potential is not flat within the box. In reality, atoms create these potential wells that are periodic within our box. Today our goal is to consider a periodic solid through Bloch's theorem. Well, what's Bloch's theorem? It's just a way to understand the wave functions and energies for periodic solids. And it comes down to two postulates. The first states that because we have a solid that is periodic at the atomic scale, which is to say we have potential wells associated with each atom, we get a traveling wave solution for our wave function that gets modulated based on the symmetry of the lattice. where u of r equals u of r plus our translation vector t. So we have a wave function that in some ways reflects the symmetry of the lattice. And also, this traveling wave solution seems to suggest that we must have invoked periodic boundary conditions for the macroscopic solid. The second postulate of Bloch's theorem states that psi of r plus t will have the same form as psi of r, just with a modulation term. And since u of r plus t equals u of r. We can rewrite this as our original psi of r e to the minus i k dot r. Since the exponentials with the r cancel out, we're left with the shifted wave function as a function of our original psi times this other term that depends on the translational symmetry vector of the lattice. So really, all Bloch's theorem does is connect the wave function of solid into terms of the underlying translational symmetry. But of course it's not enough to simply state this as a fact. Let's go through and see if we can prove these hypotheses. Nicole, why don't we start by writing down our potential as generally as you can. Yeah. Since our potential is periodic, we can express it as a Fourier series, like we've done with our scattering density and diffraction. And we'll be summing over the reciprocal lattice since the periodicity of our potential is on the atomic scale. How about the wave function? We really haven't said what kind of periodicity it should have. But didn't we do that in postulate 2? Well, be careful. We said that at some position r plus t, the new wave function would be modulated. Okay, got it. So the wave function's periodicity is connected to the periodic boundary conditions, right? Yeah, keep going with that. So if we have a one-dimensional chain of atoms of length L and invoke periodic boundary conditions, the wave function will have to repeat itself every length L. So then we can rewrite psi as a Fourier series too. It's important to note that this time we're not summing over all of G. Because we want to preserve the periodicity in L, we need wave vectors whose wavelengths are multiples of 2L. So only a subset of all k values will satisfy this Fourier series. Exactly. The trick here is to remember working on two different length scales. The periodicity at the microscopic scale from the crystal's internal translational symmetry, and the periodicity at the macroscopic scale from invoking periodic boundary conditions. Pretty much everybody gets confused at some point by these two. For now, we can take our Fourier series expressions for psi and v and plug them into the time-independent Schrodinger equation to solve for the energy of our system for a given wave vector k. After some derivatives, we end up with the following expression. Eric, that doesn't look much better, especially with all those sums. Luckily, we can take advantage of the orthogonality of our wave vectors. As an example, here's the integral of e to the i k prime x times e to the i k x where k and k prime are different wave vectors. Only for k prime equals k do you get a non-zero value for this integral. We'll start this trick by multiplying our time-independent Schrodinger equation by e to the i k prime x. Then we'll integrate across dr. So similar to the 1d integral, only the terms where k equals k prime give a non-zero solution. So now we can drop this whole summing business in k. And since we no longer have a sum to deal with, we can drop the prime and leave k prime as just k. 
and we call this equation the central equation. Now this is a really profound equation, important enough to be doubly underlined and starred. If nothing else, the take home of today is to understand the implications of this equation on our wave function and the energy of our system. Well, let's not get too high and mighty about the central equation. It's just the time independent Schrodinger equation expressed in a Fourier series form to take advantage of the periodicity of our system. Okay, true, but there's some pretty cool things about this equation. I'll give you that. What's unusual in this is, for a particular wave vector k, and its associated coefficient ck, the only other coefficients we need to know to solve for the energy are coefficients shifted by g vectors. To really see this, imagine a 1D line of k points. We saw in earlier videos that a sample as short as a centimeter would have 10 to the 7th points in the first real one zone. Let's zoom in on one of our k points. From this equation, we only care about this point, and then this point at k minus g1, and so forth and so on. Do we care at all about this k point right next to the original k point? No. What about this one or any other k points between k and k minus g? Nope. Exactly. So the utility of this equation is that it takes a set of n points, each with its own Fourier coefficient, and knocks this sum down to only a handful of points that are necessary to solve for the energy of our system. But what if I chose to look at this k point here instead of our original k point? Then we'd go through the same process of summing over g to find those c sub k minus g coefficients. And if we did that for every k point in the first Briouan zone, we'd end up with n independent equations, all of this form. For a one dimensional sample one centimeter long, that'll give us 10 to the seventh independent points, and we'll be solving each of those by hands. That's a terrible idea, Eric. Next time, we'll figure out which c sub k minus g coefficients are non-zero and simply just throw the rest out. And before we move on, if anyone is lost at this point, it'd probably be worth re-watching the beginning of this video or talking to Eric about what we've done so far. But assuming everyone's good and comfortable, we're going to move on to the wave function. Because our ck coefficients are now related to only those shifted by g, we can rewrite our wave function at a particular k vector so that it's now periodic on the atomic scale. This is a somewhat subtle point, but very important because now we only use a subset of our k wave vectors that satisfy periodicity in the sample and the atomic length scales. So now we can come back to Bloch's theorem to solve for the modulation term u of r by separating out this e to the i k dot r term. Before we end today, though, I want to bring up a couple of remarks about Bloch's theorem. The first is that we can prove our wave function at k equals our wave function at k plus g, and by extension, e sub k is equal to e sub k plus g. Second, if we think about our weak potential as so weak that it's vanishing, we can estimate our potential as a flat box, and we know the dispersion is basically parabolic. But since we're still invoking periodic conditions, we get parabolas that repeat at k plus g, k minus g, and so on. We'll call the parabola by itself the extended scheme, and the multiple parabolas the periodic zone scheme. And we're making multiple parabolas because of this whole e k equals e k plus g business. Exactly. This seems like an impractical way of representing the data. Can't we condense this business down? Yeah. Don't we usually plot it just within the first Briwan zone, so it looks like this? Yeah, that's nice, and we call that the reduced zone scheme, and it's the most common of the three to be presented when you actually look at experimental dispersions. And so the third comment we want to make is about visualizing our block waves. U is ultimately some periodic wave that repeats at the atomic scale, while the real part of e to the i k dot r is periodic on the sample scale. Multiplying these two waveforms together, we get the real part of our block wave. And this allows us to visualize how the wave function is modulated. Okay, well we've done it quite a bit today. It looks like it's time for a recap. We started by introducing Bloch's theorem as a way to describe the wave function of a periodic solid with periodic boundary conditions. And based on the time-independent Schrodinger equation, we developed the central equation. 
and found a relation between the Fourier coefficients associated with wave vector k and the coefficients associated with wave vectors k minus g over all g space. As a final suggestion, you might do well to try to explain Bloch's theorem to someone else. Since Bloch forms the basis of almost all cool electronic properties, it would be good to get your head around this derivation. Thanks for watching today's solid state physics in a nutshell. Next time, we'll look at dispersion relations for 3D systems and learn how to label points within the first Brewon zone. See you then!